This video is a review of the NMR chapter in the physical chemistry playlist. Okay, so we start by defining nuclear spin. We have the nuclear spin operators for the spin angular momentum squared I squared and the Z component of that operator. If I add my operator there. And for acting on alpha and beta, I squared gives the same values, the eigenvalue 3 fourths h bar squared times alpha and times beta. And then the Z component distinguishes spin up and spin, spin down for the nucleus of plus or minus 1 half h bar alpha or beta. And nuclei, which have non-zero values of spin that are of particular interest for NMR, are hydrogen 1, carbon 13, and less common but also done quite frequently in the chemical community, uh, nitrogen 15, fluorine 19, and phosphorus 31. So we can define magnetic moments in terms of a factor which is nucleus specific called the nuclear factor times the charge of the nucleus over two times its mass times our angular momentum operator which equals uh, that same value times now beta n defined as the Bohr magneton and these values all together this defined as the magnetogyric ratio. So getting closer to nuclear magnetic resonance we have the potential energy function of a magnetic moment in a magnetic field is defined by the negative dot product of that moment with the field. So the energy goes down when it's aligned with the field. We have the change in energy between the spin up and spin down state in a magnetic field between the, these two eigenvalues here is h bar gamma times the z component of the magnetic field. And then the frequency of that is gamma times the z component over 2 pi. So as the, magnetic, as the magnetic field gets stronger and stronger, the energy levels between our spin alpha and spin beta, our up and down nuclei, gets greater and greater, and the frequency of that energy transition gets larger and larger. So we can build NMR spectrometers, which have a kind of generator, and then we have our sample. It goes through an inhomogeneous magnetic field, and then we get, uh, we get detected as the frequency comes out, and then that gets Fourier transformed into our spectrum, which we can get our frequencies from to see uh, where these magnetic resonances occurred at a given frequency. So we have magnetic shielding, which occurs due to the chemical environment that the nuclei are in. The various electrons around the nuclei can increase or decrease the chemical shielding depending on how they're arranged. So that shielding constant sigma is typically on the order of 10 to the minus fifth. We have the magnetic field uh, beta naught equals to two pi times the frequency divided by gamma or magnetogyric ratio times one minus sigma. So our electrons affect this a little bit in terms of what magnetic field produces a resonance. And then we can define a quantity called chemical shift, which is the difference between our specific hydrogen and a reference standard tetramethylsilane divided by the frequency of our spectrometer. So with these being off by about one part in 10 to the fifth, we typically get a few parts per million for our chemical shift of a given hydrogen atom. Now looking more into that chemical shift, as we saw, it's about the difference in the magnetic shielding relative to a reference tetramethylsilane relative to our given hydrogen atom of whatever molecule we're looking at. So we have a spectrum here where we typically have uh, for, let's see, aliphatic hydrogens, things attached to alkanes in the one to two kind of parts per million range. Things like hydrogens attached uh, near to ethers might be up towards three or four or even five parts per million. And the highest things we typically see on those spectra are things like aromatic carbons up closer to eight to 10. So our spectrum can be, get, can be uh, complicated further by the introduction of spin-spin coupling. So if I have a molecule like this where I have a hydrogen, which is adjacent to two other hydrogens that are next door to it and aren't chemically equivalent, so they're just different hydrogens on the molecule, that can take that combination of energy levels and it shifts some of them up and some of them down. And the result is instead of having two peaks, one for each of these distinct hydrogens, now we have a situation where we have a splitting occurring, depending on the coupling constant, J12, 
and we get some splitting there depending on how strongly these hydrogens are coupled to one another and how far they throw off these energy levels. So when this coupling constant is fairly small relative to the separation between these peaks, we get what's called a first order spectrum. When the coupling constant approaches the same order of magnitude as the separation between these peaks, things get complicated and we have a second order spectrum. Uh, first order spectrum is much simpler and can be treated by first order perturbation theory, whereas second order requires a uh, linear variational method to approximate our energies. Okay, if two protons are chemically equivalent, meaning that they are uh, symmetry equivalent, there's some symmetry element in the molecule which makes them the same, then what happens is the shift in the energy levels ends up being the same, well the ones that we can actually transition to, and the result is chemically equivalent protons, though they do shift their energy levels, do so in such a way that there's no splitting of the peaks. So chemically equivalent protons do not end up splitting one another. Then we finally get to the n plus 1 rule, where the intensity of a, a split peak next to another uh, given proton is, based, is basically ends up being a binomial coefficient. So for example, where we have this hydrogen next to two protons that are equivalent, that would end up being what's called a doublet, where we have the ratio of the peaks integrated would be one to one. For singlets, there's just one, so we're defining one. For something next door to two equivalent protons, sorry, that, that would be the case here. We have two equivalent protons here, so n plus one is three. That would be a triplet, which has three peaks of ratio one to two to one. Quartets next to three next to three equivalent protons, like a methyl group, would be one to three to three to one. And then further on, we can go, a quintet would be one to four to six to four to one, whatever the binomial coefficient is for that uh, number of, of of equivalent protons plus one. And then finally we do uh, some looking into second order spectra based off the ratio of what the coupling constant to the distance between the peaks is and we can see that as it gets further apart the peaks are more well behaved and we can do uh, what's we have what's called a first order spectrum uh, the reverse of what I have drawn here so let me change that. So this is first this is second. Whereas when the peaks get closer to one another, uh, they do not uh, behave as well, and we have to do a little bit more complicated math in order to figure out uh, where the peaks are and what their relative intensities are.